Good evening. I'd like to call the Board of Finance Budget Public Hearing for Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020, to order. Before we get started with the presentations, I um, want to welcome everybody for coming out tonight. I will admit, I'm looking around, I'm seeing more people than last year. That's encouraging, so that's a good sign. Uh, tonight we only have two items on our agenda. Uh, the first one is public hearing on the proposed 2020-21 budget, and then we have public forum. Um, before we go into the presentations, I do want to make some opening remarks and an overview of, uh, have an overview of tonight's format and the proceedings and how this will be outlined. Um, first of all, on behalf of the board, I do want to thank all of the, um, both boards, the Board of Education and Board of Selectmen, the department heads, uh, the commission chairs, the commissions themselves, town public school staff, and the literally hundreds of volunteers that help put these budgets together. Uh, I want to thank you all to uh, thank all of you who came out tonight and for eventually all who are going to be watching this on GCTV. I know it's going to be a lot of people. So um, we hope, fingers crossed, uh, to inform themselves of the budget. Um, I want to make sure it's clear that tonight we are focusing on uh, all of you, the community and the public. Um, we want to basically assist in educating and informing everyone in this community uh, what's contained in these budgets and how they affect all of our bottom lines. Uh, since October, as some of you know, uh, and actually probably even earlier, uh, the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education have been crafting these budgets. Uh, we as a Board of Finance have been uh, part of the meetings and workshops since that time, uh, actually since November when the first capital budget workshop was held. Uh, there's been presentations by the Board of Education, the Board of Selectmen, there's been other workshops and meetings. There's been public hearings that a couple of us have attended. So we are very uh, aware of what's in these budgets tonight, uh, but now we have a chance to drill down into these, uh, into detail and um, look at them more and ask questions uh, along with the public uh, before moving a budget forward to the Guilford voters. Uh, so tonight for our format <clears throat> during public hearing, uh, we're gonna switch it up a little bit from last year uh, the Board of Education has usually gone first, and uh, actually I think there's probably been some back and forth, but tonight uh, I've decided that we'll have the town go first on their presentation. Um, what we will do is for Selectman Ho, we will give that presentation. We will have questions of the town budget by the public. We did this last year. Uh, I think that during the workshop that we're gonna have on Thursday evening, it's a little bit more difficult for the public to ask questions because it's public forum and then the deliberations in the workshop that the Board of Finance has. So this is the one chance uh, that the public, if they have questions, I think it's fair to have those be asked. If you do have a question for either the uh, Board of Selectmen or eventually the Board of Education, I would ask that you do come up to the podium and state your name and address and keep the uh, question as brief as possible. Um, well, as, as concise as possible, how's that? Um, so we will have questions uh, by the public, then the Board of Finance will ask questions. I do want to remind my colleagues that we will have plenty of time uh, Thursday night to ask questions. I'm sure we're going to be crafting those questions even tonight during the presentations. Um, so uh, we will have that opportunity um, uh, before the Board of Education goes. Uh, at that point, the presentation of the Board of Education, Dr. Freeman, Dr. Balistracy, I'm sure we'll both tag team and come on up here. Um, and we'll do the same format, public questions and then Board of Finance questions. Uh, at the conclusion of that, I'm going to do a recap of the presentations and basically set the stage for Thursday night's meeting, uh, which will be uh, the workshop discussions and we will also, um, I'll go over the capital bonding questions that will be voted on um, eventually. Um, and then we'll have public forum. So anybody has any comments? Uh, limited to three minutes, please, and uh, then we will adjourn to Thursday evening. So that is the format for tonight so that everyone knows how we're going to go through the process. Uh, I don't think I have anything else to cover, so with that, I believe the town is uh, for Selectman Hoey. Are you all set to go? Okay. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we, do we need this tonight, you think? Yes. Okay. 
All right. Um, on behalf of the Board of Selectmen, uh, I'm pleased to present uh, the operating budget for the town for fiscal year uh, 2020 uh, through 2021. Uh, and I would just like to comment that we are passing this budget along to you as, uh, as a result of a unanimous vote uh, of the Board of Selectmen. One quick uh, caveat, I think in a newspaper of local circulation a couple of weeks ago, uh, the town budget was portrayed as a 5% increase. We will debunk that myth uh, as we go through this presentation. Uh, it was a combination uh, that represented a combination of the operating budget and the uh, debt service budget. So um, as you'll see through the uh, document, the numbers are a little bit different when portrayed uh, in, a, in a different fashion. So uh, let's proceed. Uh, what is the mission of uh, town government or any town government? Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, public protection and safety. Maintaining the infrastructure, significant infrastructure, roads, buildings, etc. Uh, providing other town services that we've all come to uh, understand, appreciate uh, through our uh, various departments, park and rec, uh, social services, youth and family services. Uh, maintaining a quality of life, um, and that is uh, uh, with respect to uh, beaches, uh, parks, um, hiking trails, etc. Support the Board of Education in uh, several fashions, um, not the least of which is uh, Public Works, which maintains uh, their fleet. Uh, and lastly, uh, to promote uh, the community through economic development and tourism. The Board of Selectmen uh, had agreed on a series of objectives uh, and uh, key factors uh, for this budget cycle. Uh, and we uh, strive to continue to provide high levels of services that uh, the community has come to expect and in fact demand. Uh, and that's uh, in the face of increased, uh, uh, increased uncertainty with state funding. And we'll talk a little bit about state funding later on. Um, we are, uh, we are proud to be maintaining the current levels of the Senior Tax Freeze Program, uh, arguably one of the uh, best uh, programs of its type in the state. Um, and we have uh, restored capital uh, project funding within the operating budget to levels of three or four years ago. Um, over the last couple of years with the budgetary pressures, we've had to drop uh, below um, some thresholds that the Board of Selectmen has long held as being the appropriate number. Um, and another uh, uh, note, uh, unlike some of our uh, other governmental organizations, uh, both the town and the Board of Education are funding our pension liabilities at the actuarial recommended levels. We continue to uh, 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 continued investments in maintaining infrastructure and roads, as well as some overdue improvements in information technology. You've seen that we've focused on this over the last couple of years. We still have some way to go uh, and are making progress uh, in that regard. Some things that we've noticed. Uh, there are some demographic changes. Um, if you look at the color of my hair, um, I am uh, more representative of this community than uh, I used to be when uh, I was younger. So we are aging. And we're starting to see increased demand as a result of that uh, through senior services and our social services programs. More and more of the clientele that's being served are, uh, are falling into that, that category. Um, this year uh, was the last of the big uh, debt service increases related to the construction uh, of our beautiful new high school. Uh, we've been uh, forecasting this for probably six, seven years at this point. Uh, and finally, this is the crest of the, uh, uh, of, of the rise. So this will be the last big increase associated with that program. Um, uh, the ECS uh, funding from the state of Connecticut uh, is uh, actually uh, remaining relatively flat compared with what we had, uh, what we had projected over the last couple of years. Uh, I think we're down about 95,000 on ECS. Um, the SAFER grant is a, uh, is, a, is a key component of this budget. Uh, for those who don't recall, the SAFER grant was uh, the federal grant that we obtained in order to help us defuse the initial set of costs for additional uh, firefighting personnel in town. We hired eight firefighters and the funding that came from that grant covered 70% of their salaries for the first year, 70% for the second, and 35% for uh, the third year. We are now moving into that third year category, so uh, those, uh, those revenue sources have, uh, have been diminished significantly. Um, 
And in this budget, you'll see that uh, we have increased staff by uh, one half uh, of a uh, full-time position. In a nutshell, this is the uh, proposed budget. Uh, the operating budget uh, of 30, a little over $30.5 million uh, represents an operating increase of 2.9 percent. Um, and within uh, that, the operating capital uh, has a 20.47 percent increase. Uh, we went from about $850,000 a year in capital projects in the operating budget uh, to 1.6, uh, I believe it is, 1.06, uh, uh, a significant increase, but back to the levels that we were at three, four years ago. Uh, and as you can see, debt service, uh, that, that 10 million 495 carries about a uh, $980,000 increase over the previous year. So that is a 10.29%. Uh, um, so back to my original comments, the operating budget, a 3.4% increase, total debt service, which is shared between the Board of Education and the town, uh, represents that 10.9% uh, increase. I mentioned employee uh, uh, changes. Um, we have uh, at Park and Recreation uh, moved the receptionists from part-time to full-time. The number of, as I mentioned earlier, some of the demographic shifts have been have placed increased burden on staff here at the, at the community center, in particular um, related to programs for seniors. Um, we are adding a new public works maintainer uh, at the, the uh, unanimous recommendation of the um, Public Works Commission. Um, we had been, uh, several years ago, we had reduced, this is back in 2008, I think we had reduced uh, the Public Works uh, staff by a couple of positions. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we added one back in, and now we are adding uh, a new uh, Public Works maintainer. And this is important because we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of the demographic shifts also are hitting our departments. We anticipate uh, five or six retirements over the next uh, 18 months uh, out of the uh, public works organization. So we're going to need to get folks on board and, and trained. Um, the police department had eliminated one animal control officer, uh, and we're down to just one at this point. Uh, so the net effect is a half, uh, a half of a uh, uh, full-time position. Um, and a net change to the budget is an increase of uh, uh, about $28,500. Uh, within the operating budget, there were several, uh, uh, several departments uh, that had uh, um, significant increases or increases of note. Uh, the building department, uh, and that the building department is largely as a result of the way we are budgeting the part-time uh, building inspector. Uh, we had been uh, grossly, uh, we had been actually paying them as a contractor, um, and uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, charges have now been moved into the salary line item as is appropriate by labor law. Um, so, and we have, that also includes an increase in some of the hours for the building department. Um, as I mentioned, our capital is up 20.47%, uh, and I've got some more detail on that a little bit later. Fire department is up 6.29%, largely the result of the uh, SAFER grant um, and some, uh, uh, some, uh, some other uh, incidental programs and uh, um, building-related expenses. Uh, public Works is a 3.29% increase. Um, but I wanted to break out on employee benefits. Uh, you see reserve for personnel goes up 16.57. That's kind of an odd number. It needs a little bit of explanation. Whenever we're in a year where we have contracts up for negotiation, um, we, uh, we, we anticipate that there will be some salary increases negotiated as part of that. We do not build those into the salary line item for each of the departments. Uh, we use a, a line item in, uh, re in the HR, uh, the human resources uh, line, uh, employee benefits, that uh, is called reserve for personnel. The reason that number is so big this year is we have five contracts that we are negotiating this year. Um, and uh, we anticipate, we're already well underway on a couple of them, um, so that's why that number is a little bit higher. All other employee benefits are rising at a 1.88%. That includes health care costs, okay? Um, the move that this, uh, that the previous administration made uh, to move to HSAs has, def has definitely resulted in the stabilization of our health care costs for our employees. Uh, and um, so that number, uh, that 1.88 percent includes pension, it includes uh, health care, uh, and a couple of other smaller incidental li uh, line items. 
Uh, there were some reductions in budgets. Uh, on a legal budget, uh, this is largely the result of the, uh, the, the, the curve uh, that we see in terms of uh, um, property tax appeals. Uh, the farther they get away from a reevaluation year, the less property tax appeals uh, we receive on an annualized basis uh, and the less uh, we have to spend in, in, in terms of uh, defending those in court or with attorneys. Um, the Board of Assessment Appeals uh, obviously is down. That's a result of uh, uh, the elimination of uh, stipends, uh, some of the stipends. That's consistent with the, uh, uh, the assessment appeals process. Uh, the golf course is down 8.96%. I want to mention that uh, the golf course has been uh, the subject of uh, some uh, intense focus over the last uh, year to 18 months um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the Board of Selectmen challenged the Golf Commission, who has responsibility for the management of the golf uh, uh, course, uh, to see what they could do to control expenses and to more accurately reflect their revenues. Um, and uh, I think it's safe to say that the Board of Selectmen was, uh, was, was pleased with the effort. Uh, we had put a challenge to them last year that they needed to come back this year with some substantial improvements, and they have, and their operating costs are dropping by nearly 9%. Uh, the historic district, I want to mention this in particular because the uh, chairman of the uh, historic district actually came in with a budget and said, I did a little analysis, and he's not the only one that does this, but uh, Randy McCarty's going to get uh, uh, credit for this. He says, I took a look at the actual expenses over the last five years, and I don't think we need as much as we had last year. So uh, it, we're, we're talking about a small budget, but that's a pretty good percentage of their budget. Uh, and lastly, town properties at 1.71%. Uh, I mentioned the uh, capital budget. Uh, the capital budget is at uh, 1062000 uh, And you like this slide, Mary Jane? That's a, this was your pie chart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if it's an eye test for you back there. Um, but uh, basically, the, 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 it's, it's not a surprise to see where most of our capital goes. Um, our bigger departments, uh, public works, police, park and rec, and fire. Um, in, uh, in, 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 and I think in all of those, we're talking about vehicles. Police department is largely uh, vehicles. I think we're replacing three police cars. The um, uh, public works also has, uh, has vehicles, uh, drainage, uh, some, some drainage projects, uh, and uh, a new sickle, uh, sickle bar mower. Uh, park and recreation, um, uh, fields and uh, playing surfaces uh, account for about 197,000 of that number. Uh, and uh, the fire department is uh, largely in equipment and vehicles uh, with an additional 15,000 for, uh, uh, for building uh, maintenance software. Increases in the, operating, uh, in, in the operating revenue budget. This is the other side of the ledger. Um, as a result of a, a task force that was put together um, a year, year and a half ago, uh, we um, revise the building fees to make us more current uh, in terms of form and pricing with our peer communities, uh, those in our immediate uh, uh, vicinity, as well as those that uh, have uh, similar socioeconomic profiles to the uh, town of Guilford. Uh, interest income is up by $100,000, uh, largely the result of the fact that we have more cash on hand to invest because we are no longer uh, uh, loaning or issuing um, uh, or paying for things and waiting for uh, bonds to be issued. And this was uh, largely related to the cost of the high school. So we have more cash on hand, uh, although the Fed today slashed the rate in half, uh, so this number might not be as good as we thought it was two weeks ago. Um, state revenue is up uh, modestly. That's mostly on the uh, um, other grants and not the, uh, uh, the ECS uh, formula. Um, and I want to point out that the uh, fire department, even though that says EMS, that's, uh, that's the fire department slash uh, EMT slash uh, paramedics, uh, and they're projecting a, a, an increase of about 30000 which is going to get them pretty close to $900,000 uh, uh, in revenues derived from uh, ambulance services provided to the community. Other local is nominal. Uh, we talked earlier about the debt service. Um, uh, the new Guilford High School uh, constitutes uh, 40, almost 44 percent of our total debt service payments. Uh, the balance uh, of, of pro, uh, projects for the schools is uh, about 22 percent, and the town uh, projects that have been funded through bond proceeds uh, is 33.55 percent. Uh, 
Uh, as you can see, we applied some premiums uh, that we have uh, earned every time we issue bonds, largely because of the rating that we have and the attractiveness of the bonds uh, to the uh, investment community. All right, this is Mary Jane's favorite slide. Uh, um, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we talked about the, us having reached the pinnacle on the increases uh, associated with the new high school. And as you can see, uh, the green level represents the uh, more significant portion of uh, uh, our debt service costs. And um, that little orange line uh, goes across the top, um, depicts uh, current level. So you can see as we go out over time, our debt service payments are going to be reduced. Um, I, I might also add that that gives us the capacity uh, to do other bonded projects over those years without, without uh, uh, dramatically increasing uh, uh, future budgets. All right, let's see if I can do a little, uh, as quick a wrap up as I can. The uh, Board of Selectmen reduced the operating budgets by over uh, $438,000 uh, uh, and capital by 1.15. Uh, we didn't really reduce capital by 1.15 for most uh, of the projects that were identified as uh, being needed or required by the departments. We merely moved them out over the uh, five-year capital plan uh, that has been in place for a number of years. Um, those projects are not going to go away. Uh, but they are not going to be funded uh, uh, this year. Uh, increase in salaries is 4.81%, including the reserve uh, for the contracts, uh, but also significantly offset by uh, the assumption of more uh, uh, payroll as a result of the safer grant dropping down. Um, we increased capital funding targets consistent with Board of Selectmen goals. Uh, all other department, um, departmental operating expenses, once you pull salaries out, decreased by 0.21%. So that's basically flat funding for the operations uh, once you pull salaries out of the, uh, the mix. Um, the state funding estimates are based on a biennial state budget and we don't anticipate that anything is going to happen between now and uh, the end of May because that budget is, it's a biennial budget and they rarely if ever adjust the revenues. Um, we were fortunate enough to see a grand list growth of uh, almost 1.2%, um, which basically drove additional um, uh, tax revenues uh, prior to us having uh, this budget uh, enacted. Uh, did I go too fast? There we go. Okay. Some other considerations for the Board of, uh, of Finance. We've talked about these before. Uh, Reevaluation, which occurs every five years, we no longer have uh, a line item in the uh, operating budget to put a set aside because of uh, the wisdom of this board, set aside funds from surplus last year. So we no longer have to budget that on an annual basis. Uh, the other thing that I know you're very well attuned to and are um, supportive of is the other post-employment benefits, which are our long-term liabilities related to uh, health care costs for our retirees. Uh, and we, as uh, those in the audience, we are in the process of establishing an OPEB trust, which is similar to uh, a pen our, our pension plan. Uh, we have some $28 million in liabilities uh, out over time. Uh, we have traditionally been paying the health care costs associated with our retired employees out of our operating budget. Uh, and we have started, this is the second year, we have funded uh, a trust. Uh, we haven't actually set the trust up, but we've put an account aside. Uh, for that trust, and um, we are, um, as, so again, there is nothing in the operating budget that we're requesting that goes directly to the OPEB trust. All right, where do the tax dollars go? Um, our fire department responded to almost 3,500 calls. Down nominally since uh, last year, it's only a difference of 70 calls. But the, the graph on the right, I think, is important. Uh, prior to the implementation uh, of the, uh, uh, the fire station in North, at the North Guilford Fire Station, uh, response times on EMS were significantly longer in the, in the north part of Guilford. By putting the two uh, full-time firefighters on duty, three shifts uh, a day, seven days a week, uh, 365 or 366 days this year, um, those, those response times in North Guilford have dropped dramatically. And that's really an equity issue for this community. So the long and short of it is the SAFER grant allowed this to happen based on our staffing models. All right, 
uh, so many other uh, areas. The police department responded this year to over 1,200 uh, over 1,200 calls. Public Works maintains 49 square miles of area uh, and 186 miles of road. 12, and excuse me. You said 1,200. 12,000. 12, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ken. Um, Public Works maintains 49 square miles, uh, 186 miles of road, and we clean every year. 3,564 catch basins. Uh, Park and Rec uh, served 20,000 participants in classes and events, 34,000 meals to seniors. Um, uh, and I'm going to take a minute. Um, I have been contacted by uh, several of my peers and asked, how do we do the things we do for seniors within a budget like this? And I say, it's because we have a tremendous staff and we just, we focus and we make sure that we deliver uh, those kind of services. Um, they also maintain 40 athletic fields for our youth to play on uh, and manage over and mow over 100 acres. Our engineering department, which uh, is <laughs> serves as a liaison for the town with state and federal agencies such as the DEP, uh, the uh, Connecticut DOT, the Army Corps of Engineers, and FEMA, uh, issued 20 road excavation uh, permits, 54 flood uh, hazard permits. They're responsible for regulatory compliance on things like MS4. Uh, which is stormwater runoff. We have a stormwater uh, runoff program to, uh, to minimize pollution, uh, particularly being a, a shoreline community, uh, minimizing the impact of the sound. Uh, MSW is the managed solid waste. There are a significant amount of regulatory requirements related to us uh, uh, managing that, that project. Guilford Free Library. 270, over 277,000 circulations, 13% increase. Program attendance, over 25,000. Youth and Family Services, almost 2,700 program participants, over 2,000 clinical appointments, and provided clinical services to 228 children in our community who may not have had access to services were it not for Youth and Family Services. Uh, our Health Department conducted uh, 721 inspections. Social services um, administers 20 programs, uh, responded to 4,300 uh, calls, and assisted uh, nearly 1,000 walk-ins. In total, 625 households uh, served by uh, social services, and those are among the most needy in our community. Uh, town clerk uh, recording a significant number of deeds, issuance of licenses, uh, and you can see the assessor manages 20 tax assistance programs um, and significant number of accounts. So, with that, uh, I'm going to conclude. Um, are we doing questions now, Mike, or are we doing? Yes. Seeing that you're. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Seeing that you're, you're there. Good. Um, and as stated before, um, does anybody from the public have any. Oh, by the way, thank you for the presentation. Um, anybody from the public have any questions regarding the town budget or selectman budget? for first select me because you answered them all and <laughs> that rarely happens yeah, I well I do talk to one <laughs> you're right that's all you need. okay anybody on the board of finance have any questions I had one um, the increase on the staff the 28,000 do you have for the half position yeah was that just salary, or is that benefits as well as the cost? It's just know? salary. Just salary, right? That's a net for the three. Right. Anybody else on the board? Last call from the public. You can't let me get away with that easily. All right, so therefore, we're going to move right along. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there going to be, I guess there's going to be a little bit of a switch here for the, okay. Katie, okay. okay. is switching that over, Dr. Balstreet, Dr. Freeman. Um, I don't know if you planned on talking about the process a little bit, what's uh, been going know. on. Figured while he's, unless, unless the switch is, unless the switch is really quick, which it sounds like, it looks like it's going to be. Um, you, you've been at this for a while. Sure. Really I, will, I will definitely start. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you um, to the Board of Finance. 
I uh, just want to introduce tonight the Board of Education budget for 2020-2021. I'm going to make a few comments and then um, turn it over to Dr. Freeman, who's going to give you a much more detailed um, explanation of the budget. Uh, we bring this forward as a Board of Education with a unanimous vote for this budget. This was a budget that um, was started uh, in September and over a, <laughs> over a series of, of five months involved a number of public forums. We held a public forum in October which allows the public to come uh, give us ideas about the things that they would like to see us consider in a budget. We hold uh, a couple of meetings with the Board of Finance, which really allows them to push back on the things we're thinking about um, and give some detailed explanations about um, our considered approaches. We held two public forums in January once we had a proposed budget from uh, Dr. Freeman and the administration, which allowed the community to ask specific questions about line items and again make recommendations or requests. And then the Board of Education spent several meetings deliberating over this budget, um, really taking the time to go item by item to uh, discuss some of what we heard in the public forum and make determinations about the superintendent's budget at that point. Um, this budget reflects, as Dr. Freeman is going to share with you, uh, Guilford Public Schools' vision and district priorities health and wellness of our students, an instructional focus, and student engagement and academic rigor. Among the drivers in this budget, um, which is not something we've had to deal with in previous years in any substantial way, um, is a de decreasing enrollment. We have seen in our neighboring districts um, decreasing enrollment happening and really impacting other school systems before this year. Um, in a pretty dramatic way in some cases. Uh, schools closing um, in some of our neighboring towns. That has not been the case with us. Um, interestingly, and um, certainly positively for Guilford, um, our enrollment has been going down at a much slower rate. We're not quite sure what that's about, although we would certainly like to think that um, what we offer our students um, as, as one of the top districts in the school makes a difference, uh, so, sorry, top districts in the state makes a difference, um, a brand new high school, um, full day kindergarten. Um, so there could be a whole lot of reasons, but um, again, I think this is probably the first year where, um, where there's a substantial enough enrollment decrease that has really required our response. Um, the board's receipt of the superintendent's well-defined and careful budget, um, again, was met with some deliberation. Um, Dr. Freeman presented us a budget with a 2.14% increase. We spent, um, again, time deliberating, um, looking at particular line items, paying attention to what the public had to say to us, and are putting forth now for you tonight a uh, Board of Ed approved budget at a 2.03% increase. Um, we made a couple of reductions, I'll name just a few. A uh, $90,000 reduction, which was really a salary correction in the uh, secondary special education line. Um, we um, are, instead of um, purchasing a facilities truck, we'll lease that truck paid attention again to some public comment around considerations in, of some artists and residents and makerspace offerings which we will um, take back and really uh, reconsider in terms of approach. We also determined that we wanted to increase the pension line so that we were fully funding per uh, actuarial recommendations and we did that um, with the knowledge that Dr. Freeman had created that budget line before those recommendations were finalized. Um, and because of concerns by the board for um, a tuition line, which is particularly challenging to budget for, um, added some monies to that line as well. Um, lastly, one of the things that Dr. Freeman is going to share with you in his presentation um, are a couple slides on return on investment. Um, and we certainly cannot uh, speak strongly enough about what we think is a, a really remarkable return on investment. 
um, for this town um, in terms of the school budget. But I'm just going to note a couple of things that we know um, in terms of Guilford at a statewide level. Guilford is 19th in the state in 218 numbers of 169 towns in per, ca in per capita income but is 27th in net tax levy per capita and 103rd in equalized mill rate. Guilford is 83rd in the state in net education expenditures per pupil, and yet one of the top districts in the state by a whole host of metrics, some of which Dr. Freeman will share with you tonight. Um, so again, I want to thank the Board of Finance, uh, thank the community for coming out, and turn it over to Dr. Freeman. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Ballas Tracy. Um, it's a pleasure to share with you this evening the Board of Education approved budget that we bring before you for your consideration. Um, as stated a couple times, and I won't read these slides to you, but I do feel that it's important to note that as we begin our budget work every year, we return to our foundational documents. Every year before we begin the budget year, we remind ourselves of the vision and the mission on which this school system is built. Each year, we remind ourselves of the priorities on which we focus. <clears throat> These priorities are not an annually changing laundry list. They are, in fact, three foundational statements. Again, I will not read these to you, but one priority is that we create environments that are safe and healthy for our students physically and emotionally. We're invested in their emotional growth as well as their academic growth. Secondly, we create an environment that is professionally rich for the teachers so that the, the professionals who interact with your children every day are every year at the top of their game and growing and improving. And finally, building on those first two priorities, we intend to provide classroom settings that are academically rich and rigorous and vigorous that encourage students to grow as much as they can possibly grow in one school year. And again, these three priorities work together and create the system that we are so proud of and drive the budget priorities um, which we focus on every year. We look at the specific initiatives that are in front of us, the short-term projects on which we are working and again, I won't read these to you, but I will note that we have launched a new science curriculum and continue to focus on technology and science and engineering and mathematics in our system. We continue to master, uh, to, to build towards our mastery of, of high leverage instructional practices. We continue to want to make sure that we are a school system that is aware of a global community and participates in that global community and that we build tasks and activities for our students that again grow not just their academic um, potential but grow that social emotional side as well. And then every year the budget is built on some assumptions. We will first provide a safe and healthy school. We will maintain a dogged focus on instructional excellence. We will extend and improve opportunities for every single student who walks through our doors and that before we ask for a single new dollar, we will look at the resources that we currently have access to. Every budget decision is driven by these four priorities, and in fact, in that order. <clears throat> and finally, the budget is driven by enrollment. We are focused on the students who come through our doors. We only program and budget for the students that we know we will be serving next year. And this year, we are anticipating an enrollment decline of 73 students overall. I will draw your attention, however, to the decline at Adams, a school enrollment that projected to drop from 550 to 500, a decline of 9% in that one setting. To look at this visually and to Dr. Balistracy's point, the red line um, shows the demographic study that we commissioned some 10 years ago as part of the high school project. We wanted to look at what our a projected enrollment was going to be, and that's depicted here by the red line. And in fact, the red line is realistically what many similar suburban communities are experiencing throughout the state. Schools that are seeing a precipitous, or school districts that are seeing a precipitous decline and are therefore making significant structural changes, in fact, closing school buildings. We are seeing declining enrollment, but at a much slower and at a much more predictable rate.
There you go. And all of those priorities and initiatives and, and, um, and, um, and uh, the, the, the values that we build into our budget have resulted in a final budget request of $61,778,459. This is an increase over the current fiscal year of $1,227,628, or as Dr. Balistracy said, a 2.03% increase over the current budget year. To put that into some context, this is the history of increases over the last several years. We have walked away from a time where we anticipated three and a half or three percent or two and a half percent increases, and we have been coming forward as a school district at right around or just below two percent increases for the last several years. This budget is built on several efficiencies that have been recognized. There are reduced staffing positions in this budget as a result of that declining enrollment over the past several years. There is also a continued focus to hire and use our human resources creatively. Again, before we ask for a new position, we look at positions we have and we look to ways to repurpose or reassign or cover our needs with existing staff before making any new requests moving forward. We're incredibly proud of the medical benefit line, which in this budget is $500,000 less than in the existing budget. We have had significant success with moving all of our employees to health savings accounts. And additionally, we've had some positive experience with our health um, numbers coming in, and we've, got, we've seen significant benefits from that. It's important to note that all of our employees have the same benefits they always had, they just work a little bit harder now. They're required to do more of the administration, more of the paperwork, pay a little bit in deductibles up front, but we maintain the same level of benefits and yet generate a savings, a significant savings for the, the school district and the community. And finally, I need to recognize the work of our principals and our classroom teachers. And the only word that I can apply is frugal. We do not waste materials. We are careful, we are careful with the supplies and the materials that we request. We know that this places some of that shared burden on our local families, but we pay attention to those lines. To show you the history of the medical spending, from a high of over $10 million, this year's request is below $9 million in medical spending for our approximately 600 employees. If you look at budget by location, by our seven schools, or by our large centers like special education facilities, technology, and athletics, you will notice that the lines tend to be relatively flat or have modest increases, if not modest decreases. I will draw your attention to a furniture purchase that drives up the equipment purchase at Lakes Elementary School. This is, in fact, a success story. Two years ago, we received a grant from the Guilford Fund for Education to buy more flexible furniture for one classroom at Lakes, standing height desks, low chairs, a variety of different types of furniture that students can freely access during their instructional day. Uh, Guilford Fund for Education funded that first purchase. Teachers throughout the school, students throughout the school have seen what that furniture can do for their school day, and we are now beginning to build out into more classrooms those furniture options for the students. I will note that we expect that we will continue to roll out those sorts of furniture options for students. Those of you who have moved to a standing desk as an option in your office or in your workspace know the value that it can bring and try to remember when you were eight or nine or 14 years old, the difference it could have made if you could have moved around your workspace to, to just assume different postures and stand in different places during your school day. So while that looks like a significant percent increase, it's actually a very small dollar increase, but we recognize it as a success. And we appreciate our partnership with the Fund for Education. Each budget, while it is built on efficiencies, is also going to experience significant cost drivers. So while I've already identified salaries as one of the areas that we see as an efficiency, we also know that we are a people-intensive business and organization. More than 65% of our budget goes into salaries. It's the people in the school system that make the school system. It's the salaries of teachers and clerical assistants and lunch aides and custodians and paraprofessionals and nurses who contribute to making the schools what they are for your students. 
So even though we've got a declining, uh, a shrinking workforce this year, as we work with five bargaining units and five new ne newly negotiated contracts, we do see an increase in salary costs this year. $700,000 spread across all of our employees in the school system. Tuition refers primarily to our special education students who have needs that require us to seek services outside of the Guilford Public Schools. And that is an annually difficult number to budget for. It is a volatile number, the most volatile number in our budget. I will point out that over the last several years, we used to have numbers of students in the mid-40s that we were outplacing. We currently have numbers of students in the, mid to, the low to mid-20s that we're outplacing. We've built our local capacity to keep more of those students at home, but tuition continues to be an area where we see increase. And Dr. Balistracy mentioned the pension increase this year. Um, we do have a need to fully fund our pension liability. We fully fund that this year at an increase over the current budget of $160,000. Those three cost areas together represent an increase of $1.3 million. I reminded, or I mentioned in the beginning, the entire budget's only going up by $1.2 million. So while those areas are driving increases, we have found decreases in other areas um, to offset those cost drivers. One illustration is that special education tuition cost that I mentioned to you. The blue line represents our attempt to budget for those tuition costs outside of the school district. The red line, the wavy red line, represents our actual costs year to year. What you'll notice is that we are always right about what direction that line is going to move in. We know the troughs and we know the peaks and we know where they're going to move but we have been under budgeting for that line for several years. Nine out of the last 10 years, we've been over budget, expenses over the budgeted amount. This budget, like several others, works to close that gap. And so that increase of $400,000 that you see there includes budgeting for all the actual students enrolled that we know will draw tuition costs next year as well as a bit of a contingency to try to anticipate that shortfall and begin to close that shortfall. I mentioned that we currently have roughly half of the number of students outplaced that we had had in previous years. If you look at the line of increase that we were experiencing from 2010 to 2013, and if we had continued on that rate of increase rather than making the structural changes that we have made, the special education tuition spending could be significantly higher than what we realize now. We recognize this work as one of our greatest successes, although it continues to be one of the most difficult areas for which to budget. And finally, every budget that we bring forward to this community includes investments. I don't believe that I was invited to join this community and this educational team to continue the level of performance that you have. I believe that my job is to grow the level of performance that our schools provide, to increase the return on the investment that you make, and I've never brought forward a budget that I would portray as status quo. Every budget that we bring forward and that this board adopts and brings forward to the community moves the programming forward, and this year's budget does the well, does the same with investments in the areas of instructional coaching, embedded professional development to help our teachers be better every single day than they were yesterday. It includes an additional computer science teaching position at Adams Middle School where we want to begin offering more opportunities in coding or robotics or game design and it includes continued professional development in the subject area of science at both the middle level and the high school level as we continue to support the new curriculum that we have rolled out in that area. More specifically, this budget includes two additional literacy coaching positions in the Guilford schools and, and in the most exciting area for the first time ever at Guilford High School. I have talked before in this setting about how instructional coaching may be the most impactful and most important investment that we have made in academic performance. With these two positions, we now complete both literacy and mathematics coaching K through eight. 
every teacher who engages with students in the teaching of reading or writing or literacy or numeracy in mathematics now has access to a full-time professional developer or coach who is there to help them be a better teacher every single day. And with the addition of a literacy coach at Guilford High School, we for the first time will be offering our high school staff that same level of coaching support in the classrooms that address reading and writing and research and communication skills. It has taken us 10 years to build very slowly and intentionally to this level of coaching. And I'll again say that it's one of the most important investments and one of the pieces of this budget about which I'm most excited. The science teacher that we mentioned at Adams Middle School, again, robotics, coding, game design, and that continued professional development that I mentioned at both the middle and high school levels. This slide, however, becomes an important slide to discuss this year. So each year I come before the community and want to talk about the level of staffing that we have in key areas. So first, we're looking at no change to administrative staffing. We are not looking at either increasing or decreasing staffing levels in the administration, although I will note at the central office level, while we maintain the same number of positions, the dollar expenditure, the actual salary line for central office administration will be lower next year and is lower than it was in previous years as we have seen um, Dr. Ann Keen move on after 20 years. We have replaced her with Dr. Anine Crystal, who is exceptional in the position, but she did not come in at the salary that Dr. Keen left at. And so there has been an actual dollar savings central office administration, although there's been no change to staffing levels. We mentioned enrollment in the beginning. Both Dr. Balistracy and I highlighted that we've had slowly declining enrollment over the last several years. And this year, those numbers have accrued to the point that they make a significant change. Adams Middle School, losing 9% of its enrollment in one year, needs to be addressed. So we are proposing, or we are, this budget includes, the reduction of six English language arts teaching positions at Adams Middle School. Currently, Adams is built on a five-person team model. Students spend the core of their day receiving instruction in the areas of math and science and social studies and two doses of English language arts. We will be reducing that to a four-person team where they will be receiving equal minutes of instruction in the four areas of math, science, social studies, and English language arts. When these changes are made, after these changes are made, we project class sizes at Adams next year of 19 or 20 in the seventh grades and 20 or 21 in the eighth grades, possibly 21 or 22 at the eighth grades. That's after the reduction. If we do not make that adjustment to staffing at Adams, we would have class sizes that would be uh, the size that we project for kindergarten, and we're not gonna come before this community and ask for that level of staffing. We know that those are perfectly reasonable class sizes after that reduction is made. Similarly, we are projecting four reductions at the elementary level. We're looking at the reduction of three classroom positions and the reduction of one district-wide reading interventionist. We will be looking a little bit differently at the way that we provide reading instruction, both in the classrooms and for our students with special needs. And similarly, after making those four reductions, we project class sizes at the elementary level, K through four, of 18. Exactly the same level of our class sizes this year. So we are, and it's the first time that I have been part of presenting a budget to this community that includes the reduction of 10 teaching positions across the district. We have, the Board of Education has released an early retirement incentive for the teachers who are working in those subject areas to try to minimize the actual effect of those reductions. We hope to be able to absorb those reductions in attrition rather than actually needing to face layoffs with this budget. But again, it brings in class sizes that are right sized for this community and for the instruction that we focus on in our schools. While we're reducing 10 positions overall, we are investing in other positions. I'll draw your attention to the two coaching positions that I've already mentioned and to the science technology teacher at Adams Middle School. As I said before, we don't just ask for new. If there are going to be reductions, 
we look at what our needs are and can those reductions offset enhancements that we need to make or that we have been looking to make and did not have the financial opportunity to do in previous budgets. Additionally, I'll note that there are some small increases spread across the high school in the guidance office in the world language department and in the math department. Those increases are essentially in place to meet the new high school graduation requirements that we are responsible for as a result of state legislation that has been phasing in over the last several years. It's not necessary because of class size. It is necessary because students need to, need to achieve a number of various credits in a number of different areas, and we need to be able to have flexibility to schedule appropriately. These increases in those areas give us the flexibility that we will need to meet those needs for all graduating students. And finally, there's a very minor increase in music at Leet Elementary School. We have a music teacher who is currently less than full time, who is spending part of his day working with special education students, providing a little extra contact time in that area, and we do see a need to increase that position uh, to full time. Additionally, we are able to reduce one paraprofessional position. These are um, non-teaching positions that support primarily special education students in the district, and we're asking for an increase in this budget of a half-time outside maintainer position. This would be something who, uh, this would be a position that helps with the grounds maintenance directly around the buildings. It's not our fields, our fields are maintained by Park and Rec, but we still have grounds that need to ma be maintained. Currently, all seven buildings are maintained by one individual. This would increase that department to one and a half. Additionally, um, that's the operating budget. We will be requesting um, a capital, bonding uh, capital bond this year. The capital bond comes in at a total request of $2,615,960. It is to continue the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning work that has been happening at Baldwin over this last year. This is phase two of that project, and it's a significantly smaller amount than was bonded in this past year. And likewise, we need to begin the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning work at Lakes Elementary School. Lakes currently has the original HVAC system in place from when it was built. If you have a child at Lakes, you know that that system failed significantly last year. We have been working hard to keep that system simply up and running. It is time for that system to be replaced, and that comes in at a cost of approximately $1.6 million. Additionally, every time that we work on an HVAC project, we know that that's the appropriate time to make window and door upgrades. So we will make sure that we're increasing the energy efficiency of all the windows and all the doors. And additionally, any first floor doors or windows experience security upgrades as well for an additional cost of 238,000. With architectural and engineering fees, that brings us to the full bond request that we will be asking of voters again, of $2.6 million in addition to our operating budget request. And finally, I again want to talk about our focus and that return on investment that Dr. Balistracy mentioned. We are immensely proud of the work that we do in Guilford Public Schools. And measuring the success of a school is always a, diffi a difficult proposition. The state of Connecticut has one measure the, the district performance index or the accountability index that tries to look at schools holistically. So this is a measure of 14 different indicators, many of which are related to standardized testing, many of which are related to the smarter balanced assessments in grades three through eight and the SAT in grade 11, but it also includes Physical, uh, physical wellness, it includes access to arts classes, it includes graduation rates, it includes attendance rate in our schools. And what I appreciate is it actually includes um, growth. We don't just look at our raw performance scores, we look at how our students have improved year over year. If you look at demographic reference group B, or all of the schools that are um, demographically similar to us across the state of Connecticut, you see that Guilford falls roughly in the top third of that measure. What I'll point out <clears throat> is that last year, we were in the top two or three. 
Now, Guilford's performance has not dropped over that year. From, from last year to this year, last year our performance rating was 84.4. This year it's 84.38. What happened last year is a number of our competitors who were very close but slightly to our shoulder to the right have worked really hard in many ways doing a number of the things that we've been doing for a little bit longer and they have moved just a few points and they now stand a few places just to our left on that chart. In fact, what I want to show you is you look at all of the districts statewide. So that demographics reference group is now washed out. You look at demographic reference groups all combined and Guilford measures 10th in the state. I wanna draw your attention to a couple numbers as you move across. Look at our accountability index percent score, 84.38. I would argue that all the way up to number six on the list, Old Saybrook at 85.35, one percentage point difference is not statistically significant. That is a cluster. And then I want to draw your attention all the way over to the far right, where you see in the last two columns, Guilford's participation rate in those standardized tests that I mentioned. In Guilford last year, every single student participated in those standardized assessments. So the first column, the, the, last, the second to last column, those are all of our students. In the very last column on the right, those are our high need students. Those are students who are identified as special education or students who receive free or reduced lunch assistance in our community. Every single student in Guilford participated in that assessment. If you look at some of those districts who are less than a percentage point above us and have a much lower participation rate, particularly in that area, I would argue that the statistical difference is insignificant. And then I want to share with you my latest favorite graphic. All right, so I want to help unpack this because I know there's a lot going on there for you. This scatter plot plots spending per student, that is the horizontal line on the bottom, against performance on that demographic performance index that I just shared with you. Guilford sits in the middle of the blue X. So when you look at this chart, anybody doing better than us on that district performance index sits above the horizontal line. Anybody spending more than we spend sits to the right of the vertical line. And the difference between the blue diamonds and the yellow squares, the yellow squares are all the districts in demographic reference group B. Those are all the schools that are similarly situated to us. When you talk about return on investment, therefore, what you want to look at is the upper left quadrant of that graph. The upper left quadrant represents all the school districts in the state who are outperforming but underspending Guilford Public Schools. And I would argue that statistically there's nobody there. There's a few people that land very close right on that line and we know exactly who those districts are and we are looking at exactly what they did to be that little bit of difference than us. But what that chart tells you is that the districts that are significantly outperforming us are also significantly outspending us per student. When you talk about the return on investment that we see in our Guilford Public Schools, I am enormously proud of that visual. In fact, when you talk about return on investment in any way that you measure it, whether it's with our performance on the state's academic performance index, whether it's by looking at the national blue ribbon that our high school received, uh, this evening, it's whether it's looking at the six state championships that we have won as of this evening. I know we have teams that are still moving forward in conference play even tonight, and we still have a whole spring season ahead of us. If you look at the arts performances that we put on, on the green or on our stage in our high school, I would put the performance of the students and children in these Guilford schools up against any other community. And it's because of the support that they receive from their parents and this community in our schools that they perform at that level. We're enormously proud of what they achieve every day. We're very proud of the budget that we bring before you tonight and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Well, that was informative. <laughs> Dr. Freeman, I'm happy to go back to the Dr. Bell Stracy, thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping you answered all the public's questions, but maybe not. So at this point, I'm going to open it up. To anybody who has questions for the Board of Education um, regarding their budget that's just been presented? 
two for two in answering all the questions. Well done. Um, question. Ken, go ahead. I do. I have a question as well, but go ahead. You first. Okay. Uh, Dr. Freeman, thank you for a very passionate presentation. Um, special ed is going up 10%. My question to you is that with the we're uh, it's going to cost us close to four hundred and ten thousand dollars more this coming year what kind of support are we getting from the state is, it, is this exclusive of state support so the state supports our special education spending in a couple ways one is that we do receive dollars from the educational cost sharing grant um, that is the broadest state support that is offered. And as the chairman mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, we've been seeing our, um, our portion of the educational cost sharing grant declining over the years. The state then provides a second grant specific to special education known as the excess cost grant. The excess cost grant is designed um, built on these per student expenditures. Um, the way that grant works is that for any student that we spend four and a half times our average per student spending, which is $17,900, the, is, is, the state picks up everything above that four and a half times cost. The state has never fully met that expectation. Generally, they, they return to us around 70% of the costs above the four and a half percent. There is an amount that is allocated every year at the state level in the state budget. Those dollars are distributed across the state based on claims that are made. When those dollars are expended, there's no more to be had. And generally, over the past several years, we've received about 70%, sometimes slightly higher. I think it's been as high as 74% in a good year um, of those costs. So no, the state doesn't pick up a significant portion or the promised portion of those costs. And we understand why they can't, and it's a, it's a budget piece, um, but they don't pick up all of those costs as, as projected or promised. I have a question regarding um, something that's been passionate in the community that I've heard a couple times. Um, I was at the, I don't know if I was at the October workshops, but it was definitely at the January ones, and there was talk about the art education. And I just thought it'd be important to address that, um, the, the art education in the elementary schools, um, at least for the public who may not have heard um, the reasoning that that was not included or what the Board of Ed has been doing to uh, alleviate that or, or, or address the issue. Absolutely. So we, um, last year, when we were um, holding public forums for the, for the school year we are presently in, had um, members of the community come to us um, asking for increased art instruction at the elementary level. <coughs> Our students get, um, at the elementary level, 40 minutes of art a week. This is um, well within the guidance of um, the state. There aren't specific art standards around time you provide art. There are certainly standards around um, the curriculum, all of which we follow. Um, we would love to give additional art instruction um, to elementary school students. Um, the issue, quite frankly, is time in the day, right? That, that there's, um, we have a school day um, that must take into account um, all of our core courses, music, art, gym, a whole host of specials. Um, so we heard, um, heard the public's comments on that, um, tried to think of creative ways to address that, and put money into the budget last year for an artist um, to, to address that. And, and, and what was done with that money was to create an artist in residence program, um, which then put um, as it suggests, an artist in residence for a week in each of the elementary schools to provide a particularly um, unique art experience or special art experience, additional experience for kids um, in the school. This year, um, at the public forum, we had some parents raise some concerns about um, that approach and um, asking again for additional art 
class time, um, some of them asking for additional art staff um, in the school. Um, and we are again um, running against the difficulty, much as we did last year, of scheduling. That this is, um, it's, it's uh, we have in the state the shortest elementary school day um, by about a half an hour. Um, and so really trying to find time for additional art is challenging. What we have done um, this year is maintained for next year that artist in residence program um, with the hope of really trying to spend some time um, thinking of other ways that we can, um, can provide additional art experiences for um, parents of elementary school students who are really asking for that. I will also note one other thing which partially um, uh, addresses this issue as well. One of the things that was in the original budget that came to the Board of Education from Dr. Freeman and the administration was um, a proposal for what are called maker spaces, which um, are, would be spaces in each of the elementary schools that are equipped with a 3D printer with a whole variety of supplies that would provide um, teachers and staff to bring students to these spaces um, and do STEM projects, art projects, all, all sorts of things like that. Um, one of the things we heard during the public forum was some concern about um, putting money into a line item like that at this point um, and requesting kind of further development of the idea so that we could come back with a more developed approach um, both um, from the space and the, and the resources involved and the way it might be used. So um, suffice it to say that what we did was we heard what the community said. We decided to, again, support, as we have done this year, this artist in residence program, but to really um, take the feedback, the experiences thus far, and um, continue to think about ways to address that. Do you want to add anything? Or? No, right okay. Thank you. Yeah. And the, the maker spaces, uh, that was about a was it, that was about $50,000 that was right. in the budget? That's exactly right. That was, that was taken out? That was taken out of the budget for this year, yes. Okay. You will see it in the future budget, I assure you. <laughs> we'll be ready. OK. Just a quick, Go ahead, Bob. Just a quick question, just informational. First of all, it's great value for money. Guilford does so well, just under, under $18,000. It doesn't need to be repeated, and which made me think, uh, looking at the, the, you'd need a heck of a crystal ball to figure out the enrollment, as, as the studies have shown. And yet we see that 89 kids are coming out of the high school and, and Adams and a little are coming in down below. Of that 18,000 number, how, is it skewed at all? Is it more expensive to educate one group over another? And we, does that go into the numbers at all? So... It, it, yeah, it's a hard one to sort of parse out. Um, we have not tried to break the number down in that way. In fact, I've got lots of issues with the way the state determines that number. Different districts book different expenditures differently. Um, that number, I would suggest, is, is in itself um, a really broad attempt at average. Um, I, Do you find it to be consistent across all districts? Is it um, I th as I look at the districts that line up against us in demographic reference group B, yeah. um, you know, there are certain similarities. I can tell you that Farmington Schools, which sits right there next to us, they are just our twin. All right, Farmington and Guilford have um, embraced similar um, instructional philosophies for a long time. Uh, Farmington and Guilford have seen similar stability in, in both boards and administrative. Um, and I see that our costs are almost exactly the same. Our performance is almost exactly the same. Um, clearly, Greenwich is an outlier. Greenwich chooses to spend significantly more um, in their structure um, than we choose to spend. Um, Yes, I, I don't think that we're at all an outlier. I'm still trying to answer, is it more expensive to educate a high school student than an elementary student? Um, 
there's a bit of apples and oranges that goes into that. You know, a, guilt, a high school student could see seven teachers over the course of a week. Uh, an elementary student is going to spend predominantly most of her time with one teacher. Um, however, we've got smaller class sizes at that level. I, I'd really have to go back and parse it out in a way that we haven't. Um, we get similar questions about special education students in district compared to regular education students. That gets really hard to parse out as well because our special education teachers work with everybody. If you find a special education teacher in a classroom, you often can't tell who are the students with an identified IEP and, and who are just other regular education students in the classroom because our teachers float around. School counselors, school psychologists, school social workers work with students who are both regular education and special education. So a lot of, there's a lot of gray area and it becomes really difficult to sort of parse that out. Um, I can work harder on that. I can look into that and have a better answer for you. Wasn't one I was expecting to get on my feet tonight. Um, Statistics also, class, which is assigned to some 11th grader. I, I do also want, which is not the question you're asking, but just um, if, if anyone in the audience or the TV audience is not quite understanding this, part of, of course, why we're seeing um, the um, enrollment decreases at Adams and at the high school and not in the lower grades is because this has been happening over time, right? So we've been watching enrollment over the past six, seven, eight years. We've been watching the kindergarten and the first grade classes come in at 30 and 40 and 50 and 70 students lower. And as those classes move up, they hit then Adams and then they hit the high school, right? So, so we lose a class, I don't have the enrollment chart in front of me, but we lose, we graduate a class of 280 or 300 students and we have a class coming in of 219, right? Which is, which is why we're seeing it work that way. Just to follow up on the special ed, the, the, uh, I think it's important to touch base on, you had mentioned that that's a volatile number and how, how the projection that you have is based on past experience, but the needs of the students who are already in district can change from year to year, and there's tremendous variance that can happen when families move to town, families move out of town. So I, I mean, I've kind of hit kind of described it, but if you could just elaborate on that. No, that's exactly right. So that budget item that you see is an actual budget built on the students that we know are in our district currently. We, we adjust for the students who we know will be graduating out this year. And remember, for some students with special educational needs, we are responsible for them through their 22nd birthday. So we budget for the real kids that we know we will be supporting next year. And then every year on top of that, we attend to build some anticipated contingency but we know that things can change um, a, a family might have a student that we're currently paying tuition for and if they move out of Guilford then that's a cost that comes off of our books uh, we will have other families who will move into Guilford during the school year and if their students have needs in our placed and out, outplaced settings we will often honor that outplacement as we try to bring them into the, the, the programs that we've built in district but very often students who move in with significant needs are going to continue to have that outplaced expense and then exactly as you said, there's no way to know when children are going to experience emergent needs. And sometimes those needs emerge and they're academic in nature, sometimes they're emotional in nature, um, but there's just no way of anticipating a child this year who we're supporting in a regular ed classroom who next year may experience new challenges and we have to support differently. So the contingency that's built into this budget is slightly more um, significant than it was in the, the past budget. Um, if we can get those two lines to come together over a couple years of growing contingency and we identify that line, what I like about the chart is that we always anticipate the movement in the right direction. We're just always too conservative in the number that we place and we've come up short, as I said, in nine of the last 10 years. So we're hoping to close that gap. Um, again, it is worth noting that while that line item has come in over budget in nine out of the last 10 years, we have always found ways to absorb that cost within our budget and have not had to come to the Board of Finance for a special appropriation to meet that shortfall. We don't anticipate doing that with this budget in front of you either. 
I also think it bears repeating that the 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 fact that the budgets both uh, but the, the numbers both budgeted and actual are well below the projected line in large part due to keeping our students in district that expense doesn't show up on this graph but right. it's it shows shows up in other areas of the budget you know, one feature of the annual budgeting process is it's hard to show it's hard to account for or to explain costs that we have avoided but by investing in the programming in district now from kindergarten through that age 21 we really do serve more of our students at home locally which i think is better for the student better for the family and it has a positive side effect of reducing those expenditures out of district um, i will note that for the 18 to 21 year old students uh, we're also really proud of a collaborative um, approach that we have engaged with for the last several years with both Madison and Clinton. So where six years ago students in that age category were having to travel to New Haven every day at significant tuition expense, we now collaborate with our two neighboring communities. Those students are just down Route 1 working in a variety of locations in Clinton and Madison and, and we've again provided a better experience for them closer to their home and done it at a, a cost avoidance for the community. It's hard to call it a savings, but we know there's more dollars that we would have spent if we hadn't made those investments locally. Right. Can I ask one more? Sure. Just, just to go back to Mr. Hartman's uh, question, and I'm, I'm not going to ask you a statistics <laughs> question, I promise. Um, but part of the apples to oranges comparison is that if, if a teacher at the high school is in world language or science, they're harder to replace. And, and typically at a higher pay scale than an elementary or middle school teacher. And, and along the same lines, tying it into this budget, if there's some attrition or, or, or retirement packages that are being offered to teachers who are, getting, who are getting to a point where they're starting to consider retiring, we may not realize the savings that you might think you would depending on who avails themselves of that opportunity. That's a really good point, and I wish I had thought of it. Um, you're right. There are some statewide shortages in certain specific teaching areas, world language, science, special education, mathematics. Not all of those impact us here locally in Guilford because we can attract talent from other districts. Um, but yes, especially in areas of world language, um, if a veteran teacher retires, we're not necessarily going to be able to find a first or second year teacher that would be able to come in and fill that position because of those shortage areas. So in some certification areas like um, K through six, English language arts, social studies, um, there's a lot of candidates out there and we can find really quality candidates at a lower salary point than the retiring teacher, but in some of those shortage areas we can't. One more. <laughs> I was going to. I was just going to say, do you have another? I do, <laughs> All right. actually. And this this doesn't have to do with the operating budget. This is the capital budget, and this is just something that comes up from time to time uh, in our monthly meetings. And just looking at last month's financials, we spent just on Lakes and Baldwin about eighty one hundred dollars in emergency repairs to the HVAC systems over there for the year in the prior fiscal year right yeah. and so I just want to emphasize that if we defer I mean I think we've deferred the at least the lakes yeah. system yeah. as long as we can because it's costing us a fair amount of money each year in terms of dollars and that's not even calculating the impact on the health and well-being of the faculty and the students who are at the school so we try really hard to pace those capital requests to have um, a small number of requests each year, but the bottom line is if we had done lakes a year or two years ago, we would have saved monies that, that we ended up spending in emergency repairs. By trying to do just one or two projects a year, um, we are engaging this year in another uh, facility needs study to help us identify what needs to be replaced and create that priority list. So we've done really well over the last 10 years about getting the projects at the right time, but the fact is Lakes was a bit of a miss. We should have done it two years ago, but we were, we were rushing to do other priorities and pushing Lakes off, hoping that it would last another year or two. The new needs assessment will look at the 10 years of work that we've invested and really help us calendar out the next 10 years of it's, it's really preventative maintenance if we spend the monies up front we will avoid larger expenses when we try to to keep something running that's beyond its useful life 
All right, that's it. Will the, will the, do you expect the facilities needs that to include septic too? Because that was another area we had a couple of years ago. Will, will they look at septic tanks? And we recently had a leaching field replacement at Leeds, and so yes, we're, yeah. we, they will look at that as well and let us know if they can anticipate a failure before. Because yeah, we... it's not just the buildings. I mean, it's. Yep. Yep, we look at everything. We look at the whole infrastructure. And I believe that the town may be part of that facility study as well. We're still talking about doing that in partnerships. So we're looking at all of our properties, mm -hmm. not just the school properties. The first select must, must feel that he got off the hook a little bit from all these questions. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get you on Thursday. We can do this all night. We're enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any expansion of the advanced placement program? Um, no expansion this year, but we're continuing with both the AP course offerings that we have as well as the IB program. We will be graduating our second cohort of IB students just this June. So nothing new, but we're st IB is still new to us. We're still growing that IB opportunity and we still have one of the richest AP offerings. At this point, with a student body that floats right around a thousand students, we're offering about as much AP as we can offer. In fact, there begins to be a point of diminishing return. Um, college, college acceptance officers look at what you offer in an AP catalog, and if a student doesn't take everything that's in that catalog, there's a bit of what's wrong with you built into, you know, in the interview. We don't want to create a situation where we've created a diminishing return by having so many AP offerings that students feel they don't have the opportunity to take a course like music or, or shipbuilding or, or a PE elective for the joy of it and feel driven by the catalog that we've created for them. We want to make sure kids continue to come to school and have fun as well. Any further questions from the Board of Ed? Uh, for the Board of Ed from the Board of Finance? And you cut into your time on Thursday. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're keeping count? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's down three. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Any other questions? Any questions from the public? I'm going to open up one more time. Anybody have any questions after all this dialogue? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, I am now going to do a little speaking um, and do a, a recap because you've heard a lot of numbers. I'm going to do my best to try to summarize what you've just heard and how it affects uh, everybody uh, in this room. I do want to mention one uh, comment, um, and you may notice that one of our colleagues is missing. Um, I did get a text from him, and I just want to make everyone aware he's fine. But he got held up at work, and he had an emergency issue, and he was not able to make it. So um, he always is very responsive and says exactly why he's not going to be here. But he did text me and said he apologizes. He will be on, on Thursday, granting no critical emergency issues at work. Um, that being said, uh, on a recap, I want to go over basically four items. I don't think I actually have to go over the fourth item because it's bonding. Um, I think the superintendent and uh, uh, board chair did a fine job in going over the bond uh, questions. Uh, but I want to go over expenditures, revenues, and then ultimately what the mill rate is going to be uh, as it stands right now. So on the expenditure side, um, just a recap on the town operating budget. There's a request of $31,569,607. That's a $1,036,636 increase. That is a net change of 3.40% uh, requested. On the debt service, uh, there is a um, request of $10,495,185. Uh, that is an increase, as you heard, of nine, almost a million dollars, 978,841. That's a 10.29% increase. And the education budget, uh, the request is $61,778,459. That is a uh, increase of 1,227,628, an increase of 2.03%. If you take all of those numbers together, that is an increase of all the budgets of 3.22%. That has been requested uh, of the two operating budgets and debt service. Going to the revenues. 
again, you heard some information on the revenues and where the increases are and some decreases. Um, ultimately, uh, the request from the Board of Selectmen budget for revenues is um, property tax. Uh, the request is 97282419 that is a 2.89% increase in the property taxes and as you heard there's some offsets to that uh, interest income has gone up $100,000 that's a 23% increase on building permits uh, as the first selectman stated we have a new formula for doing building permits which is much more advantageous to us just like the rest of our surrounding communities we finally caught up uh, and that is a 62% increase of two hundred forty thousand um, dollars there was a decrease in the uh, Board of Education uh, or ECS <clears throat> excuse me funding um, I want to note um, as our first selectman said we had ex we thought we were going to get cut a lot last year uh, we thought we were going to get it cut a lot this year um, and when we found out that it was a under a hundred thousand uh, dollar reduction in ECS funds actually when I heard that I was pretty elated um, if you look at some charts though and I've heard this comment because people look at you know uh, what is it zip six and all those different uh, avenues you can get your news there is a map out there that indicates that Guilford probably got the, one of the biggest cuts uh, out of ECS funding in, in the state that is not nearly what we thought we were going to get and so we're pretty happy about that um, and so with that being said uh, we also had a pension issue last year some of you who were here probably remember that there was some uh, idea that the governor was going to start having towns contribute to the pension uh, for the Board of Education uh, for teachers uh, I should say teachers not Board of Education but um, that was 166,000 which was not realized and is not going to be realized this year so that went back into our, our revenue stream so there's been some offsets that actually have helped out on the revenue um, so the third item is how you take the ex expenditures and you take the revenues and you put this together and then and look at what is really the final item that figure uh, figures all this out and that's the grand list um, as first selectman said we have a grand list increase of I think I saw was 1.18 percent um, and that is really good that is uh, I think there was some projections that it would be a good year but I don't think we had projected 1.18 uh, percent increase but that goes to a lot of um, there's a lot of commendation that goes on uh, to that uh, I know the economic direct ec economic development director he, there he is um, Brian McGlone uh, I know a lot of development has been happening in town and that has really helped increase the grand list and I hope that's going to increase because we do have a lot of projects that are going on in town that are improving the town in terms of its um, its grand list so that being said with the grand list increasing we had a prior year mill rate of 32 well this year we are in the year of 32.03 with all of I just what every everything I just said the projected mill rate is 32.55 which is a mill rate increase of 0.52 which the number that you should all be paying attention to is that the mill rate increase or tax increase would turn in at 1.62 percent uh, that is a pretty darn good number um, there's a lot of offsetting that the grand list did for us and there's also the revenue stream from the non-tax revenue that certainly helped that uh, we are fortunate that we're in that position um, and so that's part of what we're going to be talking about and deliberating uh, at our Thursday meeting um, I do want to just recap on the bonding that the amount that will be seen that will be going to bond council uh, to send to the voters and craft the the uh, resolutions that is a total of two million six hundred fifteen thousand nine sixty and that's for HVAC at Baldwin lakes window and doors uh, upgrades at lakes and um, design uh, services for those projects so I think I got all that in um, there's one thing that I noticed um, and, and I, I I do want to share this with the board um, I had a chance to 
uh, go through some sheets that I've updated over time. Um, I will say that a lot of those came from the uh, person that sat in this chair for 23 years, but I up, I've been updating them. Uh, they have a lot of information on them. Um, I see Lou in the audience, our, our selectman, who is also part of this board and Ken has been on it and see, has seen these forms before. And what's very interesting is that as I've been updating it, um, there's, an, there's an interesting um, trend uh, that we've been seeing, and I think the Board of Ed showed it best, is that there's a, a big trend of that Board of Ed uh, education budget coming down. And we've also seen a trend of the Guilford High School and how that has uh, basically uh, really increased over time. Uh, by a three to one vote, by the way, this community voted for that to go on. Um, the fact that we've been keeping the numbers where we have been on budgets and on mill rate increases has been pretty uh, admirable. Uh, there was a lot of talk that the high school was going to take our taxes and blow them out of the water. Uh, that has not happened. Uh, not to say that there hasn't been some increases and some challenges, but for the most part, this community, but with both boards and the Board of Finance, have really done a great job in keeping those numbers down. One thing that I did see, and I have it someplace, it's on one of the, it's on the, the really colorful chart I gave you guys. Um, and I believe that if you pay attention uh, to inflation rates, and if you pay attention to cost of living increases, uh, this may be, we're very close to being the first year that we've had a mill rate increase less than both. Less than both the cost of living and the inflation rate. Uh, and again, that's been going on or could go on with the fact that we have certainly kept things in check with uh, the challenges we've had that you've all heard tonight. I'm not going to repeat them. I'm sure we'll discuss them again uh, at the workshop on Thursday. Um, but we, I, I just wanted to note that, that we've, we've had very seldom has that happened. I think the last time it happened, if I remember correctly, it may have been in 2002, and it was a revaluation year. And it was because the grand list basically popped and everything was low that year. So since then, we have not had that luxury of a good grandless growth and some really well-crafted budgets. So that's how I want to kind of end my comments for tonight. Um, before we go to public forum, is there anything that the Board of Finance has before we do public forum and then uh, adjourn? Okay. That mill rate in 2000, 2001, was 0.69 percent just for the record yep and you have the list of all the increases so <laughs> we've been keeping track of them so we know where our history is um i do want to remind everyone tonight uh and i don't know if this i don't know how quickly this gets on to gctv um hopefully very quickly um that our next meeting is in this room 7 30 thursday march 5th uh, where we will probably, we usually uh, discuss the budgets, ask questions, and then uh, move forward with the budget to pass on to uh, the Guilford community at budget referendum. So I expect that that will be happening on Thursday night. Just a reminder that we will be uh, meeting again. Uh, public forum. Anybody wishing to address the Board of Finance in public forum? Wow, you're a good crowd. I wish I could tell, I, I wish the TV, you know, there could be some interaction here with the TV, but. Yeah. Um, all right, if nothing further, then I will entertain a motion to adjourn to Thursday night. Move. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.